The brutal Israeli bombing of Gaza is resumed after the end of a seven-day truce. What is the latest from the ground? Another round of negotiations on the pandemic treaty is beginning on Monday. What is missing in the draft document? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories from the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. After a seven-day truce, Israel resumed the brutal bombing of Gaza on Friday. As we are recording, over 100 people have already been killed, hundreds have been injured and an already grim humanitarian situation is set to worsen once again. The international community had seven days to prevent this from happening, but failed to do so yet again. We go to Abdul for details as to what is happening. Abdul, a developing story and a horrifying story, the death toll continuing to rise rapidly. So could you maybe first give us a bit of context into what happened uh, with regard to the truce that had lasted for seven days? As per the reports, uh, there were negotiations going on uh, on Thursday night uh, uh, to basically extend the truce and Egypt and Qatar, those who were the mediators uh, in, uh, in Doha, they were claiming that they are looking for two more days of extension. But uh, on Friday, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, Israel basically resumed its uh, bombing all across Gaza, uh, claiming that uh, uh, Hamas has not uh, fulfilled uh, the, the demands of the truce. And uh, since then, there has been uh, bombing all across uh, Gaza. More than uh, dozens of people, you can say, have been killed. Uh, most of them are civilians. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, there was there were also uh, there is a report that the negotiations are still going on, but uh, there is no clarity on that. Uh, in fact, uh, Anthony Blinken and uh, the U.S. statesman statesman have given uh, multiple uh, statements, which basically confirms that Israel is in a mood to basically ex have a longer uh, version, uh, second round of uh, kind of its war on Gaza. And uh, it will not stop until uh, what it claims, basically, uh, it, it is able to kind of eliminate Hamas. So uh, this has been uh, the development so far. Uh, of, of course, uh, the breaking out of the truce uh, does not, uh, it, there are no clarity yet whether what will happen to the aid delivery, which is uh, which was going on all these days. And of course, it leads to uh, another round of uncertainty uh, among the people on the ground in 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 Gaza, and uh, uh, the aid agencies are also not very sure uh, what to do now. So yeah, that has this is the situation uh, as of now uh, since uh, Friday morning. All right, Abdul. Of course, this pointing to the failure, I think, of uh, countries, the global community, so to speak, uh, which there was a seven-day gap, and you know, like we said at the very beginning of this truce, a lot really depends on the amount of pressure that is brought to bear on Israel, and clearly, it seems to have not have been enough. And but, like you said, uh, U.S. officials, in fact, expressing support for Israel's claim once again, saying that it is all about Hamas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, <clears throat> pretty much giving them. Uh, a form of a, you know, pretty much giving them a go-ahead, so to speak. So, clearly a massive failure as far as the international community is concerned, despite the fact that the horrors of this war for there, were there for all of us to see. Exactly. Uh, if, you, if you read uh, what Hamas spokesmen uh, ha have been saying uh, about uh, the real objective, they have been proposing the extension uh, of truce. Hamas has been very willing, uh, if you uh, read of different media, uh, reports they are very much they were very much willing to extend the uh, truce but israel uh, was completely reluctant to do so and that basically confirms to a certain extent the claims made by hamas that this truce was basically a, a, a period which was sought by uh, israelis to realign uh, their forces to reposition them and if you see the uh, the things which happened uh, on uh, Friday morning, they dropped leaflets uh, in southern Gaza asking uh, the residents of Khan Yunis to basically evacuate uh, to where they did not uh, uh, were very clear. Uh, in the northern Gaza, there, there, uh, Israeli defense forces issued a map in which they basically had uh, divided the entire region into more than uh, hundreds of blocks. 
Uh, and basically, all those blocks represent a, a clear sign that each and whenever the Israeli forces move into one block, they will uh, evac basically uh, uh, ask the people to evacuate and, and then move in. So this is a plot by plot, uh, block by block uh, project. It means there was preparation. There were preparations going on all this while, and uh, Israel was able to uh, kind of uh, start the bombing. Uh, at the time when Blinken was still there in Israel, and uh, and before uh, the bombing started, in fact, he made a statement saying that uh, Israel is basically going to restart the bombing. So it it seems that uh, despite the pressure, and and if you see, different countries have made statements, France, Spain, and other countries asking uh, Israel to basically resume the truce. But uh, U.S., uh, as you rightly pointed out, has been very uh, uh, upfront. In basically supporting uh, uh, the re uh, resumption of the bombings and in fact offering uh, technical and material support uh, in their quote unquote mission to eliminate Hamas. So uh, all these things shows that the pressure which we were thinking is there of course was not applied in a correct way and uh, it was not there. It was more of a statement than and the real uh, intent and, and and that's exact. That's the only thing which explains the uh, resumption of the truce, uh, even when uh, Blinken was still there. Uh, and so fast, U.S. moving to basically, uh, uh, basically uh, upheld the uh, Israeli decision. Right, Abdul. Of course, uh, ironic also because the ICC official Karim Khan is also uh, supposed to in, in the region. And on, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem to. Uh, show any path forward as far as actually addressing some of the war crimes are concerned uh, that are being that Palestinians are facing. Exactly. Uh, see, uh, all across uh, the region, there there has been a, a growing uh, uh, understanding that the truce would lead to uh, further, uh, uh, basically, extension. And this may turn into a permanent truce, but it seems that Israelis and the U.S. were not were all, were prepared to basically break the truce and uh, restart the war, despite uh, the number of the despite the extent of humanitarian uh, situation inside Gaza, which he, apart from the International Criminal Court uh, and uh, the WHO, uh, the UN bodies, other UN bodies have basically repeated uh, that if the war restarts, all the uh, uh, attempts to kind of uh, provide some kind of relief uh, to the million pe uh, millions of people inside Gaza will basically fail. And uh, that would also mean that the most of the aid, aid agencies, which were barely surviving, uh, and the truce provide some kind of uh, breathing space uh, to them, will basically will completely become uh, unable to work uh, in the region. So, uh, so given the fact that there has been a worst humanitarian situation and everyone acknowledges it, given the fact that uh, there are already claims of different kinds of war crimes in all, uh, in the first 48 days of the Israeli bombing, uh, and despite the various complaints filed by different countries, uh, it seems that uh, uh, Israel is not bothered about all those things, uh, and, uh, and and that uh, and that sense of impunity is basically <clears throat> very clear when uh, uh, in the decision which it took on Friday uh, morning to basically bomb the bomb start the bombing uh, Gaza again. Right. Thank you, Abdul, so much. We'll come back to you because definitely a developing story, even though talks might be taking place. Nonetheless, it seems like, uh, you know, like you said, the horrors being pa pa Palestinians in Gaza facing definitely another round of horrors. Another round of negotiations on the pandemic treaty is set to begin on Monday. Now, the origins of this treaty lie in the COVID-19 pandemic and the common desire that humanity should be better prepared if another disaster of this sort takes place. However, the devil, as always, is in the details, and health activists are unhappy at the language of the draft that is being discussed. If the pandemic showed us anything, it was a sheer lack of equity when it came to dealing with such situations, and it seems like the draft as it is will not address this problem. To, go why, to know why, we go to Jyotsna Singh. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. So once again, discussions on the pandemic treaty, we have talked about this on the show before, uh, and of course the pandemic treaty, the genesis coming from the COVID-19 pandemic. but. 
it does look like what should be fairly commonsensical uh, does not appear to be in the text. So, could you maybe first take us to what are the key issues of contention at this point of time? Yeah. Um, so, uh, just to say that uh, from Monday, uh, that is from 4th of Jan uh, December onwards, uh, the second part of the seventh round of the pandemic treaty negotiations is beginning. And that is one week where all the governments will come together at the level of WHO. The WHO staff will be there and they will be discussing uh, and this will be a closed door meeting where we will discuss um, how what how to shape the pandemic treaty and uh, so as you have said yes the genesis uh, of this treaty lies in COVID-19 where the idea was that uh, the kind of death and destruction we saw during the COVID-19 uh, hopefully we should try that for that not to happen in case there is a pandemic in the future as well um, so that was a basic uh, premises on the basis on which uh, the treaty started to be negotiated. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like the world leaders have not learned absolutely anything from the experience of COVID-19. Um, and there are a lot of problems with the current text. And uh, the discussions began in 2021. Uh, so we are easily uh, uh, one and a half no, uh, uh, years into the discussion and still we uh, uh, just see that it is the same problems which actually cause so much of problems in COVID-19 continue to be a part of uh, the treaty. Uh, for example, uh, there is very, very diluted language when it comes to intellectual property barriers. We all know uh, that if there was so much of disparity between the vaccination rates of the developed countries and the developing countries, and especially the content of Africa, uh, that was because uh, the pharmaceutical companies were not agreeing to give up their patent. They were not agreeing to share the technical uh, knowledge uh, with the other companies who could produce those vaccines. Um, and that is why we had, uh, there was there were less vaccines and whatever was there, only few companies had control over it and they kept selling it only in to the global north. Uh, uh, not only for the want of money, but uh, uh, it has been pointed out multiple times. It was a racist attitude also where Pfizer would say that I will gi uh, give the vaccines first in global north and then it will go anywhere else. Uh, so we had seen all of this and this is because of the monopoly that these companies have over these vaccines and that is despite the a lot of research and development for those very vaccines being done in the government uh, institutes NIH of uh, US or the Oxford University of the UK uh, etc um so uh, we still have do, do not have um, much which, where uh, the these monopolies can be broken in event of a, in a future pandemic which is a very sad thing um so um, also uh, during covid it was said that you know we will uh, they had the who and other international agencies had put they came together philanthropies came together and put something in place which was called covex where uh, voluntarily the companies could share their know-how um, and they would be provided some royalty and then others could make use of it. It did not work. Voluntarily, no company would give its technical know-how to others to be able to produce. Uh, so because it is a power game. Uh, so we know voluntary measures don't work. We need uh, compulsory and binding uh, measures and it is completely lacking. Uh, in the text when it comes to intellectual property barriers. So th th that is one major issue. The other is uh, uh, about the health workers' rights. Again, uh, during uh, COVID-19, one, because of the monopolies, uh, uh, and but otherwise also with complete apathy of, uh, towards the health workers, we saw how the health workers were badly treated. They uh, did not have access to N95 masks because only a, a few companies could produce them. Um, and uh, also the very uh, 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 fact that we have shortage of staff of the health workers in normal times, it uh, hit us so much worse during COVID-19 when there was an emergency. So health workers had to do work overtime. They were actually treating uh, COVID-19 patients without enough equipment. They did not have uh, PPE. They did not have N95 mask. Um, so how do you deal with this? So there has to be a strong language which protects the health workers during these times. We uh, The June draft did have something positive where it did recognize uh, frontline workers and uh, talked about their rights. Uh, but unfortunately, the drafts that came out subsequently in October 
uh, it uh, that that language was taken away, which is also a very sad thing. So uh, that should be brought back. And uh, in fact, a, a stronger language should be brought back in the text. Right, Joseph, of course, uh, like you said, these are, uh, like we were discussing, these are very straightforward demands. Not much is being asked of the global north and the rich. But what are the kind of, uh, you know, what are the kind of sections who are placing a barrier here? Because I believe countries in the global south are, many of them at least are in favor of some of these demands, especially on IP. So what are the kind of restrictions to these demands being implemented and this language coming to the draft? Yeah. So one, it is very obvious that uh, the language of the big pharmaceutical companies is uh, making inroads in the text. And that is primarily happening through developed countries. And uh, though it is not a surprise also because uh, the Pfizer's and the Johnson & Johnson's uh, influence how U.S. speaks and Novartis influences how Switzerland would speak and Sanofi has an influence over the French government and so on and so forth. So you, so we can see that language there, um, uh, which uh, where uh, 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 regarding IP and many other things, uh, they want more protection and they don't want to give up their rights and privileges. But there's another thing, which is uh, the governments from the global north themselves uh, have this racist attitude, which comes blatantly through uh, uh, the text and their way of negotiating. Uh, so uh, there is a, uh, uh, something called surveillance and security, which means you uh, need to have good surveillance across the world to see what are the new pathogens that are infecting the populations, what are the possibilities. And you, uh, if you really have a good network of surveillance, you can stop the spread of the virus. Uh, so that is one part. The problem is that the governments of the global north want only that to happen because they want to protect their populations and they do not care about the rest of the world. So if once they know, as soon as uh, uh, one knows that uh, there is a uh, uh, fear of a spread of a disease, they can shut their borders, not allow mobility from certain nations and then protect uh, their population. Also, what it does is you with this information also comes uh, it, uh, uh, understanding and the information about the, the pathogen. For example, if China had not shared the genetic sequencing of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, free of cost with everyone, so many vaccines and medicines could not have been developed so fast. And this is the case with many other pathogens. Um, so that they would like to have at the earliest and then produce medicines. But the, these governments do not want to have binding agreements, which would ensure that everyone in the world has access to them. So it is a very one-sided thing. So uh, that is also, so there is another demand by the health activists and civil society groups and everyone in the health workers, uh, something called PPAS, that is uh, pathogen uh, benefit uh, and access sharing uh, system that has to be put in place. Uh, so that you can deal with this kind of an equality as well. Everyone has right uh, over medical tools that are produced. Um, and uh, that's what treaty should be doing. But unfortunately, th that's not happening. Right, Josta, thank you so much for that very detailed analysis of, you know, why a pandemic treaty or uh, why a pandemic treaty, at least in this shape, may not actually achieve what was originally conceived. And we'll be following the negotiations and we'll come back to you for further analysis on this. And that's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow for another episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on social media. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you have to hit that subscribe button.